So welcome back to the podcast again today. Today we're joined by a very special guest. We're joined by Own Journey Director, Shiloh Curtis. Shiloh is an inclusion and diversity specialist with over 20 years experience in coaching systemic structural and cultural change in organisations to deliver belonging and inclusion. Shiloh's had a really interesting career, including being one of the driving forces behind the Australian Football League Women's Competition, and she also led the implementation of the Australian Golf Industry's National Gender Equality Strategy Vision for 2025. Shiloh consults across a variety of national sporting organisations and industry bodies on how to lead gender inclusiveness in organisations and reach outcomes, and she coaches industry staff on their career development and inclusive leadership practices. Shiloh stepped away from the sport into the inclusion and diversity manager role at Australian Red Cross, where she is helping to lead a whole of community organisational development effort to build a greater experience of belonging and inclusion for all Red Cross people. Shiloh's expertise lies in delivering leadership systems to identify a pipeline and to coach key leadership personnel to build gender and inclusion empowered organisations. In particular, she has extensive experience in supporting male leaders as allies of gender equality. Her track record of coaching leaders in positively shaping inclusive cultures is demonstrated through her facilitation of whole of industry buy-in and in the creation of the Australian Football League Women's Competition. She is an evidence-based thought leader who understands the importance of providing a variety of motivators to meet the diverse needs of people within organisations in order to create change. It's clear that Shano is a progressive innovator who has a growth mindset and not only has she achieved everything I've just spoken about, but she is also an amazing woman who has created her own organisation called Own Journey, which she will tell you more about shortly. Today, we are lucky enough to hear from Shiloh and have her share with us her journey and the legacy that she has already created for female athletes and people of diversity. Shiloh, welcome to the podcast and thanks so much for being here with us today. No worries. It's uh, lovely to be here. And I, yeah, maybe I should have been off camera for that bio. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's always kind of kind of weird when you put your career onto a bio and then you've got to sit there and hear someone speak about yourself it's, it's always a bit disconcerting fun you know in some weird way yeah it is in, in some you. way but it's all the achievements that you've done and I'm sure that you'll tell us a lot more about those today I've given a, a really quick overview in the intro but for those that don't know you can you tell us a little bit about your background where you've come from where you are what is own journey and what was your inspiration in creating? Yeah, great. Um, well, Own Journey is still kind of trying to identify what it is, to be honest. And um, I guess the genesis of Own Journey came off the back of me leaving the AFL. So in 2016, after I'd been in AFL Victoria for 10 years, doing that work on, you know, um, creating change so that the AFLW would get up and going. I, I, when everyone else was really excited and I was exhausted um, of 10 years of, of doing that work. And so actually the, the, there was sort of some restructuring and redundancies that were on the table if I wanted one. And so, I, yeah, I opted for that rather than stay in the system and thought I, I just need to do something else. I'm not quite sure what it is, but I need a rest and then I need to work out what I'm going to do for the next half of my life. So it's kind of weird. You get to four, I, I, I hit 40 and I'd achieved what I felt was my life's purpose. And then I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> what do I do next? What do I do for the rest of the time I've got? Um, I don't need to be here anymore. I'm done. <laughs> um, so, yeah, the going journey, the, the initial concept really came off the back of, I guess, all of that time that I'd spent um, running high-performance programs and establishing the high-performance pathway in Victoria um, and then sort of combining, you know, I guess my passion with sport and, and my experience because I once upon a time was a school teacher, my, my, my work in secondary schools working with adolescents, but also, I guess, my, my, my tertiary training in health promotion so in community development uh, and psychology. So really own journey was going to be, I guess, a combination of like, all of those influences and essentially own journey as a, in its first incarnation was a, a, a travel and wellbeing concept. 
Um, and the program was designed for young people aged 18 to 23 transitioning from adolescence to adulthood using international small group travel as a platform to facilitate that development of some emotional intelligence capabilities as part of that transition into adulthood. And so, um, yeah, the intention was to was to run small small group travel for young people, and we we ran a pilot program in at the beginning of 2018. Um, so it sort of took 12 months of planning and and development. Ran a pilot program, um, and uh, you know within 24 hours, um, understood the success of of what own journey um, could be. Um, already, there were really early. Um, yeah, really early changes in the young people we worked with and just some of the conversations that took place even in those first 24 hours, bringing together sort of eight young people that um, didn't really know each other. There were a couple of little pairs that had sort of travelled together, but mostly they didn't know each other and what we were able to craft through that. So we spent um, time in Cambodia, I think it was 10 days in Cambodia, and, and wedded, woven throughout that experience every second day was a, a workshop of sorts that was co-delivered by myself and also an organisational psychologist that I had worked with during my time at AFL Victoria. So we developed the curriculum and then um, and then co-delivered when we were away. And, um, yeah, the program was really, a, I guess, a journey of self-exploration and I guess that mantra of just, you know, discover the world, discover yourself, which I guess we all kind of do in a sort of organic way, you know, when we go off traveling as a young person, but I wanted to create an intentionality around it and, and some guide rails and some resources that young people could lean on as they went through some of that self-exploration. So, um, yeah, it was a really, it was a really fantastic experience and, and, and trip. And there was heap, there was, there were heap, heaps in it, but of course, as a, uh, yeah, as an entrepreneur and, and building a startup entity that was, you know, travel based, um, you know, I needed to make sure some money was coming in. So it was not like I, I came back from that trip in Cambodia and uh, yeah, it was, was encouraged to apply for the role at Golf Australia. Um, it was a great opportunity and, and something that I, I thought I'd like to do and, and continue to develop my leadership craft. Um, and I thought, that I could continue to grow the business as I did that role. And then just a few months later, I got the opportunity to speak at TEDx Sydney in 2018. And so that really, I guess the preparation around that took up my took up time. And then from there, um, speaking at TEDx Sydney, I then was um, yeah, approached to speak um, uh, as a speaker for Saxton and, and then start keynote speaking and so my keynote speaking work sort of really picked up from there um I was already doing some stuff with Melbourne Business School around um, some keynote speaking and so and then I was working full time um so there was there was probably 2018 half of 2019 where I said okay well own journey needs to be as a travel concept needs to be dormant for the moment until I work out how I can make more of myself and um that was probably something that I couldn't do <laughs> um, was just create more time. And I had to make a real, I had to make a really intentional decision about what I was going to do with the, I guess, the travel company and, um, and where I was going to go, you know, how, how I could continue to have the impact that I wanted to have on, on, you know, evolving leadership within our community. And um, yeah, and I, I guess I made that call to go down that that spark, that path of you know keynote speaking and, and working um, with with leaders in the community. So, um, and it wasn't that long after that that uh, COVID stopped all international travel. And I think at that point I was very glad <laughs> that I was that I had these other revenue streams coming in, and I wasn't I wasn't running a travel company full time because uh, yeah, it would have been quite challenging during that. That, that period of course so that was kind of the genesis of own journey what I've done with it since of course it's more it's sort of molded its way into some of the other things that I you know I guess the paths that I've, I've chosen to go down and that's that keynote speaking consulting leadership development and and of course executive coaching as well now so particularly with a, a lens around inclusion and inclusive leadership coaching so um it's probably not too different I guess to what the driver was for me in create, creating that travel company. And that is, I guess, to walk alongside people and, and provide a platform and, and a, a space for self-exploration and, and facilitate the growth of, of people in the community 
for them and, and for the holistic well-being of our community. I think that, the, you know, what I do with Own Journey now compared to what it was, I guess, in, you know, formed to do, I don't think it's different, but the mechanism is different. Um, and so, um, yeah, I guess it will continue to evolve as, 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 I, as I grow. And, um, but um, it's been a really wonderful journey um, to sort of establish my own thing and learn about the world of being a startup owner and being an entrepreneur and the lessons around that um, and the challenges, how it challenges you. And I've really, I, I personally have grown a lot. Um, yeah. Through that period. I want to touch on a couple of things that you've said in amongst um, your answer there is that after 10 years of working hard to fulfill your dream and, and your purpose, you needed a rest because you were tired. So you stepped away from the AFL, opportune time because redundancy is on the table, which is great. How important, how hard was that decision? And then how important was it for you to actually take that break? Because as corporate people, which you and I both work with, um, you know, driven people that want to succeed and their journey is like diff everyone's journey is different, but their journey quite often is to get to the next level, to get promoted, to, to succeed in business. And you had done that and you had done far, far more than that because your reach and your impact was phenomenal in getting AFLW to where it got to. How important was it for you to recognise you needed to stop because 10 years of running hard? And then how did that manifest for you later on in you being able to then do some, have the space to do something different? Yeah, good question. And, look, you know, it was, it was, a, you know, it was a really big decision. It was kind of, it, kind of like leaving a marriage, you know, a 10-year ma marriage. And even beyond that, I mean, I'd been a player in the game for quite a significant time before that, I think. Um, you know, and and I guess, you know, for me, the origin of my, I guess, my, my journey to working in the AFL really starts when I'm about five years of age and I discover two things about myself and about sport, I guess. One is that I'm really good at playing football, um, but the second thing is that I, I'll never get to play the game professionally simply because I'm, I was female and and the message that left me as that five-year-old girl is that to be female is to be deficient, that I was unworthy and that I was not enough. Um, because if I was worthy and if I was enough, there would have been the same platforms and spaces as there were for the boys and men. So, you know, I guess my path to the AFL started when I was so young and and that five-year-old girl, she always walks, she's here with me now, she's in yes. these conversations, um, you know, and and so that kind of punctuation point of saying I'm actually going to let this go now um I don't need to be here anymore I've played my role um it was really challenging you know and I was so immersed I guess you know I probably worked over 55 hours a week for 10 years solid um and it wasn't healthy I think the way in which I had I worked but sort of had to work um the way in which you know we were structured the resources in place like there was so few resources um in each state um to invest in female footy so I had to do everything and in, in lots of ways, I was running community, you know, setting up community competitions and establishing a, a high performance pathway, trying to emulate what the boys had and trying to give the girls something that was credible and respectable that would help develop them and cultivate their capacity so that when those senior key decision makers got eyes on them, they, that they could respect the talent, respect the product, respect the work of those young women, and then believe that you could do something with that. Um, but, it, you know, it was a case of you had to build it first before they'd invest in it rather than them take a risk and just invest yeah. in something that I, they didn't yet have any evidence of. So, you know, there was there was a complete lack of belief in the power and potential of the women's game. So kind of had to build the potential first on the smell of an oily rag and then, and then showcase it to the decision makers to lobby for change and lobby for investment and, and for attention. And then we got there. But, you know, I guess to do that, I had to do all of that you know, someone like me in each state. And we all pretty much did that in isolation in each state. We had each other to lead on, but in terms of, you know, person hours, um, you know, you had one one FTE probably doing the role of three or four FTE really. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I was pretty cooked at the end of that. And and also I didn't really know any other way to, to work, you know. I just 
you know, you run hard, harder, you know, you know, in footy, you, you run harder for longer than the opposition and you outrun them and outlast them and outwork them. And um, so you can overcome. And, and that's kind of how that, that was kind of how I operated, I guess. Yeah, it was a really challenging thing for me. And my identity was so wrapped up in my role and I had to, it wasn't even just leaving my role. It was leaving that identity. And that, like I talked about that five-year-old and that pay, those pain points of my past you know, and actually stepping into something that was new and something that was not yet defined and there was uncertainty and, you know, at the time I decided, you know, I defined it as, you know, jumping into the black hole, not knowing where I'd land, but just trust that I'd land somewhere and that I was resourced enough and networked enough and capable enough that I'd, I'd, find, I'd find my way to it, to the light, you know. And, yeah. and for anyone who probably knows me and, and I, you know, I'm a pretty typical Capricorn. I, I like security and I, you know, I, I like certainty. And I like structure. That was probably the biggest risk in my whole life that I think I've ever taken, um, you know, in, in lots of ways. So, um, yeah, it was really challenging. But um, it, was probably, it was the absolute, I will say, absolutely right down, you know, hands down, it was the best decision I ever made because when you do that, you have to, you've got no choice but to look yourself in the mirror in a really honest way. You know, what is it that I that I did that I that I could have done better or I could be better at? Um, where are my areas for growth? How am I going to get there? Who are the resources? Who are the people that have got my back? Who can I lean on? What have I got within myself? What are my own strengths and capabilities that I can leverage? And you know, I think women aren't very good at, at identifying what we're good at often. And that was one thing that was just so incredibly important that I, you know, it was me. That's it. You know, it's just it's me. So what have we got? Like, you know, my five-year-old and myself, like, what have we got? And I'm 40 and I've got to craft something new here. So you had no choice but to look yourself in the mirror and see all of yourself. See the spaces that you weren't great at, but also see the things that I was pretty bloody good at. And how was I going to leverage those things to overcome the things that I wasn't great at and grow in those spaces so that I could grow a life of purpose from that point onwards. So, yeah, look, I had about six months off, to be honest. I had a really good rest and I travelled overseas to the States for about six months, um, no, six weeks, I should say. I caught up with some friends over in the US, some people that I was networked with over there and, and um, you know, and I pretty much had the endless coffee for that six months, I reckon, with people as well and just said, what does my situation look like through your lens? What do you see that I can't see? Um you know, what is it about me? What are my capabilities? What are my gaps that I'm not seeing? And and really just trying to get a fuller picture of who I was and what I had to offer the world. Because like I said, you know, I was 40 and I didn't think I had anything else to offer because um, I'd done it. Um, so, yeah, it was it was a be- quite a beautiful experience, I think, overall, um, it, you know, in, in taking that, that, that leap. Um, and I think um, the journey I've been on since then, you know, I'm a... I'm a better person, better leader, much more balanced. I definitely don't work like that anymore. I'm very, I work smarter, not harder, and much more self-respecting. I think I'm, I'm much more um, protective. Kinder. I'm yeah, kinder, kinder to self. Kinder to others, but I think I'm much more protective of my own well-being, um, and I take, I take better care of myself now, and. Um, yeah, creating outcomes in, in the community and, and, you know, creating a community where everyone thrives is important, but included in that everyone is me. Yes. And whereas in the past I didn't really worry about myself, it was about creating this thing for others, for those girls that come after me and, you know, the women that have still got a chance and, you know, and I just didn't put myself in the picture. I wasn't very good at putting myself in the picture as well. So now it's... It's not about being selfish, but it's about being selfful and making sure that there's a real balance in what I do. That it's things. If it's not good for me as well, then I'm then I don't then I won't do it. Mm. Um, there will be some boundaries in place. So yeah, it was a it was about eighteen months, I guess that six months off, and then twelve months where I got that clarity of I'm going to build this company own journey and I'm going to go down that path, and then spend that twelve months kind of learning how to set up a business. And yeah, it was quite a, a fascinating experience. Mm. So you said that um, you um, took time to look yourself in the mirror and this is something that, and you touched on it, that 
women, we don't see what we're good at. We just assume that everyone's good at that because we're good at it, right? But we're all good at different things. And quite often, we because we're so busy and, you know, we've got multiple things in the air that we're juggling, we don't often acknowledge just how bloody good we are. Like we've all got different strengths, right? And sorry, that's my dog. Just, uh, I'll just give them a treat to get them out of the way. Um, we don't acknowledge how good we are at different things. And you did something that I don't think a lot of people would do. You went and asked others how they see you and what is their lens on what you're good at and what you're not. When you asked others, um, were there any surprises or were you like, okay, well, that's just re reaffirming what I think. I've looked in the mirror, I've seen that I'm good at that, and I've seen there's a gap over here and other people are seeing the same thing, or were there surprises? Um, I don't, the, the, big, the, the thing that comes up for me as a surprise is how much more people thought I was capable of compared to what I thought I was capable of. Yeah. Um, that was probably, you know, the the shift. And so one of the things that I did go on and do, and I still do today, is become an AFLW commentator. Um, and so, I was, you know, that, you know, I work with ABC for radio and, and Fox for TV commentary. And, but I spent that first season, I think I, I think I wrote for, I wrote for ESPN and I, um, called games for, I think it was Fox, Croc, SEN and ABC. Like I had worked for four different broadcasters and, you know, I never would have thought that, that that's something <laughs> that I'd end up doing. And, I, and I, to be honest, I really love it. It's, it's, it's really fun. And, you know, I guess probably I had a realisation earlier this year in the season that, or just the last season gone where, you know, I'm, and I'm surrounded by the most amazing people in the commentary space. Just so, and in fact, I'd say it's probably the most supportive space I've ever found in sport. No, to be it's honest. great. Oh. The real, yeah, in the sports broadcasting, you know, I, I, there just is such a, a, a an appetite for women's voices and women's lenses, and people really want us to succeed. And and there's so much support. And AFLW is a really great place to support emerging talent. And I found it just one of the most supportive spaces I've known in sport. So. Yeah, I've, I've really, really kind of loved working in that space and um, just learn. I mean, it forces you to learn about yourself, to be honest, and you get to support other people. But, yeah, I think what I realised this year is that, you know, probably sports broadcasting or being a sports journalist or something like that, it probably feels like something that I'm, if I was born now, um, that I've, I feel like that five-year-old girl would be called by and but that five-year-old girl in my time and place in history um, never really, never actually considered that because she just never had any role models. And, yeah, it, was it wasn't something there. that you've ever seen. It wasn't there. Yeah, yeah so it just it was never present. Like not even that I didn't even, I didn't even think about it going, oh, I can't do that because women don't do it. I just didn't even consider it. Because I just never, I just was, it just was never put in my consciousness. So, um, yeah. So I, you know, we talk about, you know, I often talk about that five-year-old girl healing, and I guess my commentary, you know, the, the sports commentary component is part of that healing, but also it's part of that, you know, part of that play element. I can't play the game anymore because my my knees are too crooked and a bit old now. But, um, yeah, I think it's an it's a way for me to still play the game, be involved in the game. And I don't have to worry about who wins and who loses. It's it's not stressful. All I have to do is talk, turn up, talk about how wonderful these women are, many of whom were kids that I've mentored and coached and managed over a long period of time. But I, I say I've got the best job in footy because I all I have to do is turn up, talk about how wonderful they are, talk about how great they are, help the community love them even more, and then I go home. That's it. Um, I don't have to worry about trying to win a game next week, you know. So, um yeah, so I guess that's I guess that my capability in the sports commentary space was probably the surprise. I, I just didn't even think about that for myself, to be honest. And I didn't think I'd ever be. I didn't think I'd be good at it. Um, Isn't it wonderful so yeah, how was, opportunities arise and you you take them? You're not sure if you, how good you're going to be at it, but you took the chance. You did it, and then you love it. And now look where where you are. So. Yeah, and I think probably, you know, was, I've done a few um, programs that ABC have run and also Emma and Lucy Race, who are just amazing 
broadcasters and podcasters themselves that you know I've established a an, an entity called making the call and so really trying because you know commentary is a sports commentary is it's no kind of structured pathway you just kind of do it yourself in your own garage or your bedroom and you know you try and knock on doors and you know there's no kind of university pathway really um outside of doing you know sports journalism for instance so um yeah I've, I've done a, a few of those you know a few of those um programs along the way and um it's been a really it's been a really good place um to kind of grow my craft and and grow my capabilities and um but also meet people who can support me as well and i remember doing some voice training actually and um with abc and and uh i think i've done there will be seven seasons in now so at the end of the fifth season the sixth season i was doing this it was the, the first season that i didn't lose my voice and what i realized is that it was also the first season that I felt like I was good enough to belong. Um, and I feel like the first five seasons after every game, I, I thought they were going to sack me um, and they didn't think I was any good. Um, and that, yeah, that, yeah, that they were just, they just took me because there was no one else, you know, or um, all the women that are playing, I haven't retired yet. So yeah, it probably took me until season six. And I think this is really interesting, you know, what, you know, how I spoke, how I used my voice, where I spoke from, you know, your voice box is an instrument, you know, is really up here where yes, your anxiety sits. And, yeah, I think there, I think what's really interesting, the year that I realised that I belonged was the first year that I didn't lose my voice and I called so many more games than I had in any previous season. So that was a real learning for me, the importance of feeling like someone belongs, how it physically manifests in how they show up, and that's, you know, one of the important things about why us creating a community and entities and organisations where people feel like they belong is so critical. So they're not sitting up here in their anxiety, but they're comfortable enough to sit in their body yeah. and they can be calm and be fully present with you. Yeah, and that's a really important thing because anxiety does sit in your throat and up here and, and you know, your heart will race. It sits in the upper half of your body. But that throat constricting and opening is massively important when I do coaching with people and I ask them to tell me where in the body a certain feeling might be they think I'm crazy right but when I get them to sit with it and to feel into it they can identify is it in their gut is it in their chest is it in their throat where is it in the body and particularly for women when we feel uncertain or scared or threatened or in a place that we're not quite sure quite often our throat will constrict and mm. until someone asks you about where is it you quite often don't don't recognize it but quite often when you're saying something and you're not feeling safe or you're not feeling secure or certain or confident uh, and you're self-doubting you might <clears throat> or you might swallow or you might but you'll feel it in the throat and then it does manifest physically so what you're saying that you lost your voice at the end of every season but then when you felt like you belonged it all went away Talk to me about this, the importance of sense of belonging because what you're doing in creating that inclusive space is creating a sense of belonging. And whilst you did it with 18 to 23-year-olds back in 2018, you're now doing it through your coaching and through what you're doing in community. You're walking alongside people and helping them feel like they belong. Talk to me about are there any common themes that you've encountered where people are stuck or they might have an old mindset or that they don't belong? Is there any common themes through your coaching or through your community work that you're seeing come through that might go back to a limiting belief or something that as a child they were told and they're carrying that with them like your five-year-old self? Is there something there that you've noticed? Yeah, I think it's that overarching piece of I'm not enough. Um, that I'm not worthy, that, you know, there are all these messages that we get as we grow up in, in life, you know, we're born enough. It's the world that's told us that we're not enough. We're born yes. enough simply because we're human. Um, but the world around us as we've grown up has, has given us lots of messages, you know, I'm not pretty enough, I'm not skinny enough, not feminine enough, not straight enough, not intelligent enough, not white enough, whatever it might be. Um, and so we get all these external messages and those external messages become internal and all of a sudden it's not just the external messages but it's also our internal voices that start yeah. to say, 
that marry up, you know, with that external stuff. So you've really got to, I, mean, I think it's really important, you know, challenging that, you know, those external and those internal voices, but to do that, know yourself and know your power. So um, that worthiness piece, I think, yeah. and certainly for me in my own development, I, I, you know, grew up as a pretty closeted um, queer kid, um, grew up in a place where there wasn't a lot of, um, it was pretty homophobic. Um, it's pretty white and pretty Anglo-Saxon community out in the western, outer western suburbs of Melbourne. My dad's from Turkey. He's, you know, not that practising a Muslim, but, you know, certainly we grew up with a Muslim cultural, you know, Turkish Muslim cultural connections. And my mum's dad was from Hungary and my mum was Catholic. So really multicultural household, multicultural experience growing up, but quite different to all the other kids I went to school with. And that became a source of, harassment and bullying and whatever as well so and then I look like this you know I'm quite an androgynous kid and um you know um and then you know really closeted around my sexuality and you know I was born in 1976 went to high school 88 so it wasn't the safest place I think the year I left high school was the first time 1994 was the first time that Mardi Gras was televised on tv so I didn't get I didn't get that at high school and so didn't didn't get we didn't get any exposure to that. So, you know, these constant messages of you're not enough, you know, you're not, you know, I wasn't male enough to play sport and I wasn't feminine enough to pass as being straight. And so all of this kind of stuff, and you know, I wasn't white enough and I wasn't Anglo-Saxon enough in my family. So these things really started to eat away at my own, you know, they really ate away at my own sense of self-worth. And I think the point at which, you know, I realized that actually I'm worthy. And I am enough, even when I make mistakes, um, I am worthy and that I'm enough. Um, that's when my life really changed and my reframing of my life and the things that I was dealing with and the things that I wanted to do in my life. That's when I was able to personally reframe the next steps for me. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I think that piece around getting to a place of feeling worthy and being enough. And I think um, the way in which we can do that for others is to show up in a way where we're able to say, I see you, I see your, your, your unique lived experience. And I don't only really see that, but I respect it and I hear it and I value it um, and I want to know more about it. So how do we do that for everyone around us? How do we see, hear, value, respect, understand everyone else's lived experience and not see it through a deficit lens but how do we see it as a through an abundance lens like yeah. you know when someone walks in ticking the boxes that say someone like me tick don't go oh she oh she's got all of that so you go oh my god she's got all of that like she's got experiences that I'll, I'll have never known and aren't we so lucky to have those experiences in our team because imagine the perspective she's going to bring and then they'll do the same for you and they'll do the same for the next person and because our intersectional identities are unique you know you can have two people born in Melbourne you know who both present as white straight Anglo-Saxon cisgender heterosexual middle class people but even those two people their lived experience will be unique and it'll be very different from the other absolutely um, so we have to make sure that we make space to see that in others as well yeah and, and just touching on that two twins can be born in the same household and grow up in the same environment and still have very different experiences because their uniqueness on how they view a situation or how they view the world will be unique to them. And I encourage people to explore their uniqueness and to appreciate it, be kind to yourself and learn to love that about you because that's what makes you you, right? And if people don't like that, well, then maybe they're not your tribe. So... You know, find find those that lift you up, not those that bring you down. Because there's a lot in the world. There's a piece in there around those lived experiences will test us and challenge us, but also um, celebrate us and enable us, depending on, you know, what privilege or what disadvantage those things bring for us. And it's, yes, and so those, the lessons that come out of that, those, you know, the lessons from challenge, I talk a lot about um, the disadvantage of privilege. That it, and it's it's no different to working with, you know, athletes who've, co who've been able to coast on talent. I, I do some development coaching and some mm -hmm. under-14s and under-16s and with girls still now. And, 
you know, if you've got a girl in your team that is really talented, naturally talented, she's lucky enough to get that kind of DNA, you cannot just let her coast on talent because at some point the talent pool will get wider and deeper and she'll end up in a place where everyone is just as talented and talent doesn't matter anymore. It's all the other stuff you've been able to package up in and around the talent that's going to be the term, the determining factor. It's the, the resilience, the yes. ability to bounce back. It's the leadership. It's all of those other emotional intelligence skills that's going to be the determining factor. And there, there are women that, I've, that I know that were so, so supernaturally talented but never made AFLW or high performance standards because they didn't have the other stuff to leverage when everyone else got just was, was just as talented. So I think yeah. that's a super important thing. So when if you sort of, I guess, if you look at your life and things are pretty easy, start hunting for the hard because yes. it's going to be the hard that's going to give you the advantages. And when you look at your boardroom and you look at your executive team and if they've been able to coast on the privileges in life, it's not their fault. It's just, it's, I mean, it's just how we're all, you know, the time and place in history we're all given, the lottery of life. But if your boardroom or your executive team haven't known struggle, mm. then what's the resilient skill set that you've got in that decision-making space? And yeah. when things get really hard, what what do they call upon? What do they lean on to mm. overcome? Mm. Exactly. Um, because sometimes when we're, we're down and we're facing that challenge and we think, oh, my God, I'm never going to be able to get back up, somehow we do. And then we look back on it and it was one of the biggest learning things that we could have and we can take that with us so that next time we're more prepared, we're better prepared, we've learned from that experience. But when you're in it, sometimes it's a bit overwhelming, but knowing that you'll get through it and then taking those learnings, that's where your growth is and putting yourself in situations where you're not sure. Like when you took that leap of faith to start our own journey, you didn't know how it was going to go, where it was going to go. You had a vision. You took a chance, right? And it was probably one of the most rewarding trips you would have had to Cambodia with those young people. So that's, you know, just massively important to take a chance and then also to learn from those uh, experiences where things don't go well. I know that you mentioned uh, on your um, LinkedIn and things like that, that you're you, an advocate of positive psychology. How do you incorporate that into your coaching programs or into the programs you deliver? Yeah, great. Thanks. So again, I guess I think it just comes back to, um, you know, controlling the things you can control, really seeing challenges, opportunity to get even better and to grow and cultivate self. Um, if you look at, you know, not just, um, I guess, the, the work around growth mindset, but also benefit mindset, being open-hearted as well as open-minded and yeah. and the way in which you can um, influence the lives of other people and the, the benefits you get within yourself around being open-hearted and, and being able to invest in the capability of others and being really, you know, strength-based in your approach. And um, I think they're probably the key principles that I, that I use and, and, and what I use to coach others is exactly what I use to coach myself. Yeah. Um, because for me, leadership, the older I've gotten and the more experienced I've become, for me, leadership so much isn't about other people. It's not about the relationship I have with others primarily. It's about the relationship I have with myself. Um, and, and knowing myself and seeing myself and being present with myself. So in those moments when, you know, those not so flash parts of me show up when they should be there, I can actually have that conversation in the moment and go, hey, Shiloh, it's probably not the best version of you that we need to, that needs to be in this interaction right now. Um, and then having the skill set to, to placate that and calm that part of myself down so that in my leadership, you know, shows up in a really positive and constructive way so that in my leadership of others and leading teams and leading thinking, um, the best constructive version of me is present. But to be able to do that, you've got to have such a really healthy relationship with yourself and call yourself out on your stuff, understand your own origin story and journey and the things that that play havoc in your head when you get triggered or when things aren't going as you'd like them to and not be disarmed by them, but in fact do the opposite, disarm them with some personal strategies that, um, that you can use in the moment when you've got that self-awareness and to pull yourself back 
and say, hey, it's not who I want to be right now. This is who I need to show up as. So for me, that's what leadership is. It's about that relationship you have with yourself. So your secondary leadership relationships are really constructive and positive. Yeah, and I, I wrote a program a few years ago called Life, L-Y-F-E, Lead Yourself First Every Time, because in my experience, I've had to learn where my natural abilities are, and that's great. And then when sometimes I might have a natural ability that is so innate and so ingrained in me that it can be disarming to others. So I need to pull it back a little bit so that I'm not overusing it and catching myself and it's like okay not not so much like yay not so much of that just a little bit yay (laughs) so it's my enthusiasm can sometimes be overwhelming to others as well and I worked with a um a senior leader years ago and I thought my enthusiasm and can do and come on team was um was a lot his was over the top like Literally, he'd bounce into the office in the morning and he'd be green and, hey, everyone, how are you going? And it's like, okay, you just need to calm it down a little bit because you walk in and people are like, whoa. Yep. So I, I often say to people, observe where things work really well for you and then sometimes where your natural abilities might be a little bit too much in certain situations and then just catch it, just change it a little bit and then engage differently. So observe, catch change and engage don't change who you are just tone it down a little bit or when you might be feeling that little bit of uncertainty borrow a little bit of confidence from another time or from a memory that you have where you were confident so that you can step into that unknown space with a little bit more confidence so you've achieved so much already in your life um, but I think the world has still got a lot to see from Shiloh So you've left the legacy of the AFLW for all of those young ladies coming after you, those female um, athletes that want to play football. But in the terms of the mark you'd like to leave on the world now that you've done your 40 years, you've come through that journey and where you are now, how would you like to be remembered in another 40 years' time? Oh, um I think for me, you know, my purpose is all, my, my purpose really is simply around playing my role in the community. Um, you know, playing a role, my role in the community in, in creating, um, yeah, creating, I guess, the achievement of the collective and individual potential and health and well-being of the communities that we all live in. So for me, yeah, for me, it's just, being a role player and if you think about a you know sporting team the best players that you want in your team as a coach and the best people you want to play alongside are the people that are prepared to play their role they know what their role is they accept it and they perform it really well they're coachable athletes um they've got they know when it's their turn to stand up and and shine and that they'll do that but they also know um when it's their turn to enable others to achieve their potential and, and so on. So that it's, they're really complementary in their, in their mindset and their approach. Um, so I guess that's, I, you know, that's my purpose is around ensuring that I play my role in helping um, our community be the best it can be. And to do that, we have to help the individuals in those communities be the best that they can be. And to do that, we have to ensure that those people aren't stuck behind doors that we persist in keeping closed through discrimination and prejudice. So, you know, the role that I want to play in all of that is is around removing those doors, kicking them off the hinges, um, ensuring that people know that they can take up their rightful place in the world and that they're celebrated and other people, you know, understand the joy of celebrating other people and, and unleashing the potential of, it, of everyone. And I think, you know, the work I do in inclusion and diversity, I, you know, I just love it. You know, like belonging is not something for those other people. Belonging is something we all crave and actually we need in order to achieve you know, I guess our potential. So we all think, a lot of people will think that inclusion and diversity work is all around providing opportunities for those people, you know, those people of colour, those gay people, you know, women over there, like all of those, it's very othering, this kind of mindset. But what we don't, what we don't often think about is that when you open doors for those people who've traditionally had them closed, when those people step up and take up their rightful place in the world, they can become all of who they can be and they achieve their potential and they bring the gifts of that potential to the community 
And who benefits from that? Everyone. We all do. Yeah. We all do. And so it's not, I mean, it's not a totally altruistic selfless act. Mm. It's about, that. It, again, like, you know, we spoke about earlier around that balance piece. It's around, if I make things better for you, I make things better for me because you get to be the best version of yourself and I get to experience the best version of you. Absolutely. But if you're stuck behind those doors and you're not and you're frustrated and you're angry, that's who you're going to show up as in the world. And I'm going to also experience that. Yeah. So it's about, yeah, for me, it's around, you know, I guess the purpose piece for me, how do I want to be remembered? I want to be someone who delivered on that purpose. Um, you know, I guess I'll be dead by then, so it doesn't really matter what anything anyone thinks of me. But I guess that's the path that I'm on. You know, I talked about before being 40 and not knowing what's next for me and not really having a picture for myself. But, you know, that's that's what my purpose is. And, you know, I never would have thought it would have taken me to golf. I never would have thought it would have taken me to maybe I might have thought Red Cross, but I don't know where it's going to take me next, you know. Um, but I think that's the bit, you know, my North Star is around my purpose. My purpose is so, um, it connects up so many different parts of who I am as a person. And it really, yeah, it's my North Star. It guides me as my compass point when I get a bit lost as well. So, yeah. um, and if that's what I'm known for, if someone that stayed true to my North Star, then that's fantastic. Yeah, and I think based on what I know of you and what you've done so far, you've definitely stayed true to your North Star. And, you've, and your star has shone so brightly for others, which is just so powerful. So you're living your purpose each and every day in what you do. So to finish up today, what advice would you give to anyone who is feeling lost, uncertain, um, they might be experiencing a setback or facing a major life choice at the moment and they're just not quite sure because you've been through all of those things and they might have lost their confidence. What piece of advice would you give them? Um, you might feel like you're drowning but don't stop searching for a toehold find something that will at least buoy you up mm. and that might be that might be your strengths you know you've really got to lean into your strengths use your strengths like your little floaties or your life boy that'll keep you afloat until you develop you know, the fitness to tread water and then eventually that treading water might become, you know, doggy paddle and doggy paddle might become a bit of a, you know, a crappy old swim and then eventually you might become, you know, a great swimmer and you'll and you'll find your way to something much more solid to stand on. I think, um, yeah, I think that's that's always what I try and do when I feel a bit lost or a bit uncertain. You know, look for a toehold, you know, put my floaties on my arms and, and just and and trust trust that I that um trust that I'll get myself where I need to go. Yeah, fantastic. Good piece of advice. So just keep going and find that toehold so that you can get your floaties and get going and get moving. So thank you very much for being on the podcast today. I'm so grateful for your time and for you sharing everything with us. I will put a link to your LinkedIn profile in the show notes so that if people want to reach out and work with you or engage you as a speaker or a coach that they will be able to find you. And thanks again, Shiloh, for your time today. Really appreciate it. Yeah. No worries. Terrific. Thanks, to, thanks for having me along. No worries.